There's like um something something written on it on the sides right here. Uh, yeah, I guess we're gonna go to St. Patrick's Cathedral now, which is right here. St. Patrick's Cathedral was founded in 1191. It's considered to be the National Cathedral of Ireland, and it's also the largest in the country. Its history is so complicated, my brain just refuses to comprehend it. I just gave up reading about it. From the pre-reformation period, to the reformation period, all the way to the 17th, 18th, and 19th century, it's just way too much information. All I can say though, is that if you're here in Dublin, don't miss seeing this cathedral, because it's really significant. All right, so the first thing when you enter the castle or the chapel is this. But apparently, it, they kind of turned it like in sort of like a museum where there's a fee to get in. It's about eight euros. But this is the chapel. So this is a grave stone. It's a grave site of this people. This is actually the grave of Jonathan Swift and his closest friend. Jonathan Swift was a famous writer. He's the author of the book Gulliver's Travels and was the dean of the cathedral from 1713 to 1745. You'll see plaques and sculptures on this wall honoring him and a few notable people. Kind of reminds me of the Westminster Abbey in London because inside there's a whole bunch of like memorial and stuff and gravestones. Here's another section of the castle. I mean, that looks like castle, cathedral. Cause it looks kind of like a castle, that's why. But um, it does, it feels really old. Oh look, they have seats on those sides. I think they're like, I'm not sure what they are. Let me see. This is like the main, the center of the of the church. There's like pews on each side here. Kind of, um, this reminds me of um, like when the king is on court, the king sits there and all the knights and the bishops and everybody sits on both sides. Well, at least that's what it looks like, especially with those flags and medieval helmets. It actually took me a while to figure out what this section is for. And after searching online, I found out that this is where the choir sits or stands during mass. So this is the very end of the chapel. I think this is um, an active um, area where they hold mass and stuff. This is at the very back, or yeah, at the very back end of the chapel. And right here is where the, the knights and the king sits. <laughs> there it is. What do you call these? Stained glass windows. Looks nice. And then right here is, um, the way out of the cathedral if you go further down there. See, um, those are the seats I was talking about. They actually have names written on it. So I think they're like famous, like or important people back then that sits there. Oh, look, I was right. See, they have their flags and stuff. It's the knights. Huh. Look on this corner, there's a, like a really weird stairs right here. Look at the stairs. It goes all the way up. Maybe to the bell tower. It's really narrow. I wish we could go up there, but we can't. From someone who has little knowledge about this cathedral, I would say it's still pretty amazing. I'd probably appreciate it more if I had better understanding of its history. You know, although it's the largest cathedral in Ireland, it seems small compared to the churches I've been to. But there's so many things inside this church, such as tombs, the door of reconciliation, 
the bells and the organ, which is one of the largest in Ireland with over 4,000 pipes. It's definitely a place you shouldn't miss if you're here. All right, I guess that's the end of our tour here. Um, the church is not, not that big. It's pretty small, but um, it's really nice. It's interesting. Really old though. But um, we're gonna go to our next destination now. Our next stop is, um, not sure. The Marsh Library. The Marsh Library is just next to the St. Patrick's Cathedral. It's the first public library in Ireland dating back to 1707. It has over 25,000 collections of books and manuscripts, and I've read that the interior is well preserved, so I guess visiting this is like going to a museum. So from the library, we pass the St. Werber's Church. This church was built in 1178, but the current building you see here was constructed in 1719. Aside from it being old, I'm not really sure if it's significance, except that it was used by the earliest settlers in Dublin. Anyway, moving along, we pass by the Christ Church Cathedral. The church was founded in 1030 by King Silkenbeard, who was a Norse king of Dublin. It officially seats both the Church of Ireland and the Roman Catholic Archbishop in Dublin. It's older than the St. Patrick's Cathedral, which are both, by the way, the only medieval cathedrals in the city. Like the St. Patrick's Cathedral, its history is also vast and complicated. The building was extensively renovated from 1871 to 1878, as well as 1980 and 1982. Because of the renovation, it's difficult to tell which parts are medieval and which parts are Victorian. Anyway, today it's a center of worship for the United Diocese, and it hosts notable annual events such as the ordination of priests and consecrations of bishops. It's also famously used in films such as The Rain and The Tudors. In fact, some of the outfits worn on the film can be seen inside the cathedral. Right next to the church is the Dublinia, it's a museum focusing on the Viking and medieval history of the city. It also features historical reenactments where real people or actors play roles as Vikings, complete with costumes and props. We could have gone inside the Christ Church Cathedral, but somehow it was temporarily closed at that moment. I think they were doing something inside. And the Dublinia, on the other hand, was just one of those places where it's okay for us just to see and pass by. I guess we're just gonna pass by these two. We're not gonna go in. Just a few yards away, we came across another church. Um, this is that church, I can't even pronounce what it is. But it's clearly closed, so we're not gonna go inside. This is called the St. Audience Church. It's the oldest parish church in Dublin that still functions as one. It was founded in 1190 and was once the most wealthiest parish church in Dublin. During the 16th century, the church started to decline and was in need of repairs, but the funds were low. Although many repairs were done to the church and the tower over the centuries, financing the maintenance has always been a problem because there were very few Protestants or members that remained in the parish. I don't know if it's a coincidence, but to this day, it looks like it's still going through some kind of repairs. After I tried desperately to make some kind of music out of this thing, which was harder than I thought, we planned to go straight to the Guinness storehouse, but again, we ended up passing another church. This is the church of St. Augustine and St. John, commonly known as John Slane Church. It was established in 1874, but originally, a medieval hospital called the St. John's Hospital once stood here in 1180. Fearing an invasion in 1316, the citizens of Dublin set fire to a nearby street, causing the flames to reach the hospital, and inadvertently burning it down to the ground. Instead of rebuilding the hospital, it was decided to build this church instead. So here's another church. It's called St. Augustine and St. John the Baptist, I guess. Um, we're gonna try and go inside. Although this church was opened in 1874, the exterior of the building was completed in 1895, and the interior which you see here was completed in 1911. So it pretty much took almost 40 years to complete this church. You know, as I walk around this church, I realize after traveling around Europe, well, at least the cities I've been to, churches and cathedrals are the most common landmarks you'll see. 
They're the most preserved and continuously renovated throughout the centuries. Some of them even dates back to the 3rd or 4th century. You know, now that I think about it, it's not only here in Europe but all over the world. If it's not churches or cathedrals, it's temples or shrines or monasteries. I guess as human beings, we've been always longing for something to believe in or entrust our faith in. Makes you kind of think why people always look for the meaning of life. Okay, now that we're done with the chapel, um, we're gonna go to the Guinness um, warehouse or the Guinness Museum. But first we had to eat lunch and we found this restaurant along the way. All right, I'm gonna get the shepherd's pie. I have to. And she's gonna get the chicken. <laughs> And we both ordered a pint of their local beer, which looked really refreshing if you ask me, especially after walking all day. Right. Brown sauce. English mustard. Malt vinegar. And mango. Uh, ketchup. So this is the shepherd's pie. The dish has many variations, but I believe this one is more traditional. It's minced lamb cooked with vegetables and topped with mashed potatoes. The shepherd's pie or cottage pie originated in the United Kingdom sometime during the 18th century, and it's one of Ireland's popular dishes. The dish was conceived by the use of leftover meat of any kind, while lining the bottom and sides with mashed potatoes as well as on top. Now this is called chicken goujons. It's basically a fancy way of saying chicken tenders. Anyway, it's deep fried chicken strips with chili and garlic mayo sauce served with fries. I think she ended up ordering this because she didn't like anything else on the menu. But for me, I've been waiting to eat this since we've got here and it's going to be my first time to try it. So the first thing I did was to see what it looks like inside the pie. The pie was really hot and smelled so good once I opened it up. I've had lamb before and it didn't smell like this at all. Maybe it's the sauce or the gravy that gave it that amazing smell. If you notice, there's also bits of onions and peas in there too. Alright, let's see. It's hot. Despite the fact that it was piping hot, this shepherd's pie was really good. Actually, it was amazing. To be honest, I was preparing myself not to like this. I was expecting it to be gamey because it's lamb. It actually tastes like beef. And the gravy was absolutely amazing. It's seasoned exactly the way I want it. I would say the closest dish I could compare this to is chili con carne or sloppy joes. Having it with salad was a great touch as well, although it really doesn't need it. It really didn't say on the menu what kind of vegetables they have in this dish, but I could definitely see the peas and onions. I think they might have some carrots in there too. Oh, and the gravy was nice and thick just the way I like it. And combining it with the mashed potatoes is nothing else but genius. You know, I think if the gravy wasn't as thick, I probably wouldn't like it as much. Can I get some more? It's like beef. It doesn't even taste it. I had to convince her to try it because she doesn't like to eat lamb. And I think her exact words after trying this was, Why does it have to taste like beef? You know, I think this dish might have changed her mind about eating lamb. I'm very satisfied. I love it. I love shepherd's pie. <laughs> mm. I was really happy about this dish. I have to say the shepherd's pie has become one of my top favorite European dishes after eating this. Anyway, she wanted me to try her chicken tenders and after tasting the pie, I wasn't too excited about this. Although it still looked pretty good. But first I had to try the fries with my shepherd's pie before anything else. And I have to say, it works. The chicken tender is actually pretty good too. Hmm. You know I'm glad we ended up eating here because we didn't know anything about this restaurant. We just happened to pass by it. The food was amazing. Even the chicken goujons was surprisingly good, especially with the garlic sauce. But the shepherd's pie was something else. I was really blown away by this dish. So after um, lunch, we're gonna go to the Guinness and I think it's over there. The restaurant was really close from here, so we didn't have to walk that far. But when we got here, I was really surprised to see the size of this place. It's a big facility. 
this horse is here. Oh. Alright, so this is the... This, this place is like the whole factory, huh? It's huge. So the Guinness Brewery is this whole entire place, over 64 acres of it. It was founded in 1759 by Arthur Guinness, and the only beer they brew is the famous Guinness Draft, which is a dark Irish dry stout that originated here. I'm pretty sure you've seen one before. This brewery is the largest brewer of stout beer in the world, which produces about 50 million barrels a year, I think. The Guinness is one of the most successful beer brands in the world, and in spite of its decline throughout the years, it still remains the most popular and best-selling beer in Ireland. Anyway, in the year 2000, they established the Guinness Storehouse, which is where we are at this moment. This building is the Guinness Visitor Center. It has seven floors explaining the history of beer and the process by which they make Guinness. Of course, you have to take a tour for about $28 to see all that. Oh, and the seventh floor is where you'll find the gravity bar. That's where visitors can drink a pint of Guinness while checking out the view of Dublin. Um, we decided we're not going to take a tour, but we're going to have a drink. We're going to have, for sure, we're going to have a beer, right? Guinness. Uh, still full from the shepherd's pie, but um, okay. We walked inside and um, we didn't want to take a tour, but it was like $25 or 25 uh, euros for one person to get in. We actually wanted to just go inside and uh, buy, um, buy a pint of Guinness, but unfortunately we have to, we have to get a ticket, a $25 ticket or 25 euro ticket just to get in there and get a free pint. And I think it's not even worth it. So um, we're just gonna go ahead to the next stop. And maybe later at night uh, during dinner, Guinness right there. We're, um, we're just gonna order a Guinness from whatever restaurant we're gonna go to. So let's go. Yeah. All right. I really wanted to drink my first Guinness here. Well, at least here in Ireland, but unfortunately it comes with a tour. You see, we chose not to take the tour because we just didn't have enough time. We'd rather visit a few more landmarks. Plus, they probably won't let me film anyway. Okay, I don't know where we are, but we're supposed to be here. It's the, um, it's called the National, the Irish uh, National Modern Art Museum or something. It's supposed to be here. Um, not quite sure where it is. It may be, it's maybe this whole place. Not sure. I just asked this guy that um, where the museum is and it's actually right there. It's right behind me. It's called the IMMA. It's the Irish Modern Museum of... What's Irish Museum of Modern Art. Irish Museum of Modern Art. IMMA. There you go. Of course, we're not gonna go in, but but we're headed this way because we're gonna go somewhere else. Look at this clock right here. Not that clock, but this clock. This is like a what do you call that? Sundial. A sundial, right? Is that crazy? Here, let me go get a close up on it. There you go. Ah, sundial. So coming out of there, coming out of the museum, if we're gonna go straight here, is the next stop, which is the prison. I can't even pronounce what it, the name is. It starts with a K, but we're just gonna walk there right now. Just walk straight over here. It's actually beautiful walking here. Um, the breeze smells really good and fresh. Although it's kind of, I think it's going to rain, but it's nice. It's a nice walk here. Alright, it's a nice place to walk. It seems safe too. <laughs> the place we're going to is the Kilmainham Jail. It was a prison from 1796 to 1924. Known for its imprisonment and execution of many Irish revolutionaries during the struggle for the Irish independence. Today it's a museum and unfortunately it's closed because we came too late. You know, now that I think about it, we should have just taken that tour at the Guinness storehouse. It's raining right now. But the, the prison is right behind me. And we're supposed to go to a memorial back there, but it's raining and it's getting late. We have to go back to the hotel. Right now, we're just gonna go head back to the hotel and probably like walk around Temple Bar and look for a place to have dinner and 
have Guinness for sure. All right, so um, we ended up here. We're gonna eat right here at this place. Uh -huh. As it turns out, the restaurant is full. We tried to get a reservation, but they're completely booked for the night. I was really hoping to eat here because it had great reviews as a steakhouse and they serve fresh oysters too. Anyway, we decided to come back here tomorrow and have lunch instead. I guess we're gonna look for another restaurant somewhere here. So after walking around Temple Bar, looking for a place to have dinner, which by the way we found out is kind of difficult if you don't have any reservations, because every place we went to are all full. But then as we're about to give up, we spotted this restaurant. It literally had no customers at all. It's either they just opened as we walked in or their food sucks. But we didn't have a choice at this point but to eat here. We didn't want to look around anymore. Well, at least they have Guinness. Finally, after waiting a few days, we'll have our first Guinness here in Ireland. See, I've had this beer before, so I know what it tastes like, but this will be her first time to try it. I have to say, I'm a little curious to see if it tastes the same here compared to the Guinness they export in the US. Well, it tastes exactly the same. It kind of has a coffee flavor to it, and it's a lot bitter than a typical beer. The texture is heavy and a bit creamy too. I think it's an acquired taste to like this beer, and if you ask me, I'd still prefer a lager. So we moved seats because um, there's really nobody in here. <laughs> and, and, um, I guess they don't mind if we move, we're gonna move seats because we were sitting right here. This is a good spot because the table's bigger. So since we're unsure about the food here, we decided to share a dish and got the sirloin steak and king prawns. With it, we also got the garlic mushrooms. I kind of had my doubts about the food, but so far this steak looks really good. The shrimp on the other hand though, looks a bit small considering they're supposed to be prawns. Although I've never had shrimp on top of my steak like this before, but it still works. Well, aside from the steak and prawns, it also came with fries, salad, and some kind of sauce. It could be garlic sauce, I'm not sure. Now this right here is the garlic mushroom smothered in garlic butter with a salad on the side. I've had fried mushrooms before and I usually have it with ranch, so the garlic butter would be something new for me. Since we're both sharing this, I asked her to cut the steak for us and see how it looks like. The steak as you can see is a medium and it's perfectly cooked just the way we wanted it. At this point my doubts about this restaurant is slowly going away. Now I'm just thinking for $30, this steak should have been a lot bigger than this. So cutting through the steak is just like cutting through butter. The menu says it's 100% Irish beef sirloin. You know one fact I found out about the Irish beef is that it was banned in the US in 1998 because of the mad cow disease and it was only lifted in 2013. Well on that note, it's time to try the steak. And for my first bite, I decided to try it with the sauce. You know, I don't understand why this place had no customers that night, because the steak was absolutely amazing. Okay, it could be that everything on the menu was expensive, but almost all the restaurants in Temple Bar are all priced the same. And the weirdest part was that all the restaurants around this place is packed with people. Either way, the steak was really good as well as the sauce, which I still couldn't figure out what it is. The prawns was cooked perfectly too. I'm not sure if it was grilled or pan fried, but it was really tender when I cut through it. The taste was really savory. It had a hint of butter mixed with steak juice. It was really good. Amazing. This is amazing. So lastly, I tried the garlic mushroom. Although their mushroom was drenched in butter and garlic, it still had the nice crunch to it. It's funny because I still felt like I needed some sauce on this, so I soaked it some more with its own sauce. It doesn't really matter how you cook mushrooms, I'll still eat it. Now the sauce would definitely match well with the prawns, and if it had a little bit more garlic in there, it would have been perfect. Without a doubt, this steak was way better than the one I had the night before. It just had so much flavor and the prawns worked well with it. The sauce, the fries, the salad and the mushrooms were all equally good as well. But is it worth $30? In my opinion, it's not. I'll probably price the steaks somewhere around $13 to $15 and the garlic mushrooms around $4. Oh, and I almost forgot to mention, as we ate and enjoyed our meal, the Guinness started getting better. It just blended well with the food. So after we finished off our food, we decided to grab something sweet as we head back to our hotel. You know, for the past few days while walking around Temple Bar, we noticed a lot of people coming out of this shop, eating ice cream with a huge waffle on the side. Well, I think this ice cream shop is known for it, but we weren't in the mood for a huge waffle at that moment. 
So we just ordered a couple of scoops of ice cream and brought it back to our hotel. So this is our ice cream. We brought it back in my room and we're gonna eat it here. So it's kind of melted already. This is um strawberry right here. Hmm. Wow. Hmm. She got chocolate. And um, underneath is vanilla. I ordered vanilla and uh, strawberry. It's kind of hard. <clears throat> it's kind of weird because um, I had to mute what we're talking about in the um di during dinner because there's music in the background, so I had to mute that. Um, I wish I could just like talk on the fly, you know. But whatever. There's a lot of copyright shit that I hate. There's a little bit of music on the background. Just to put a copyright on you right away. But here, there's no music. I'm in my room. I hate music. Copyright music. I hate it. I have to be really careful with what I film and stuff. All of the places that we've gone to had background music. So most likely I'm going to have to remove the, the audio of me talking about the food and stuff. Just because of that. And, um, I'll probably narrate it. But anyway, um... So as I continue to gripe about copyrighted music while I eat my ice cream, we ended our day here. We actually covered a lot that day. We had our first Irish breakfast toured the Dublin Castle, walk around inside St. Patrick's Cathedral, had the most amazing shepherd's pie, and finally drank Guinness beer. But again, we weren't able to see the National Leprechaun Museum. So since it's our last day in Dublin tomorrow, I'm gonna make sure on the next video to see the Leprechaun Museum first, then eat at that restaurant we weren't able to go to for dinner, and then afterwards, we're gonna check out this famous street and a few museums and landmarks along the way. That's good, but... Is it too chocolatey? Too chocolatey, mm -hmm. huh? It looks like it. It looks like... Maybe you should have gotten like a chocolate and another. Another like flavor. Like vanilla, yeah. There's like specks of chocolate chip in it. It looks like a brownie from here. It's really, uh... Really thick. Rich. Yeah.